Good morning, church family. Sure is good to be with you all this morning, and I sincerely mean that. I really, I really do appreciate this church. I know I tell you that a lot, but I really do. I was thinking that recently, and I've been meaning to tell you, and I get so excited about my sermon, I forget to tell you. But for like the last two or three weeks, I, needed, I was thinking, you know, I need to just tell the church how much I appreciate the church. I really do. It's a great church family. We love you too, brother. Thank you. And I feel that love from this church, and I hope you feel it coming from me and my family. You know, you never know who's, who's watching, so you hate to say things that go on the internet, and, and you know, but I'll just say it. I don't mean this to be a put down of any other churches I've pastored before, because all churches, I, I've, I've appreciated all churches I've pastored at, but I just really do uniquely appreciate this church. This is a very special church, and uh, it's a great blessing to, to be a part of this church, you know. As a member, I'm, you know, or I'm a member too, it's not just, not just a pastor, it's, it's great to pastor and just be a member. This is a wonderful church family. We love you and, and thank you guys for, hey, letting us serve here. <clears throat> All right, you ready to go? All right, let's go. Let's pray and ask the Lord to go with us, amen? All right, thank you, God, for the time we have now to study the Word of God. Father, enlighten our hearts and minds Please, Lord, reveal to us Jesus. Help us to see him in a clearer and more beautiful way than we have right now, Father, myself included. Lord, our minds are all on some level, they're darkened by sin. Like Paul says, we see through a glass darkly. May you just wipe that glass a little cleaner for us, Father, so we can see Jesus more clearly and see the beauty of who He is and who You are, Lord, and we can in some way be changed because of that. We ask in Christ's name, and we thank You, Lord, because we know You're doing this, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, we're on uh, message number seven in the series, Journey to the Heart of God, okay? And uh, this is in the TruthLink series, and these studies are online. You can just Google Truth Link and they'll come up. You can follow along that way and you can also have the study guides that are in uh, the bulletin. I always emphasize this. I want to continue doing this. You will get the most out of this series if you read through these lessons. These are really good lessons. I love the way they just frame these, these important doctrines for the last days of Earth's history. They frame them in a way that is very Christ-centered and that are, this is really like almost like new light in a certain respect. It's like... It's an advancement on where we've been before, okay? We've been able to prove certain doctrines from the Bible that they're true biblically, but we haven't always centered those on Christ and showed people the beauty of these, of these truths, right? And so that's what we're doing in this series. That's what these studies are designed to do. So please, take advantage of it, guys. It's a, it's a great opportunity. A journey to the heart of God. Doesn't that sound beautiful? Don't you want to take a journey to the heart of God? Amen. I do too. Well, we'll start here. Anybody know who this guy is by any chance? It's probably good you don't, I'll be honest with you. Um, he's, a, he's a boxer, and he's like the heavyweight champ now. So I kind of keep up with the news and what's going on and usually take a few minutes each morning to see what's happening. And I saw there was this big heavyweight fight, you know, and, uh, and, and this guy beat another guy. And so he's the champion. What, what, what got my interest in this is his story. His story was just really kind of unique. So I'll tell you a story and how this, this ties in here. His name is, you won't believe his name. It's unbelievable. Tyson Fury. Isn't that a boxer name? Tyson Fury. His dad named him after Mike Tyson. Okay, so it was like destined for this. <coughs> and he just lucked out to have the last name Fury. So it just goes together. Tyson Fury. And he's from Britain. And He's huge. He's like six foot nine, and he weighed in. I want to say it was, I think it was about 273. Six nine, 273, right? No wonder he's the heavyweight champ. So, um, so anyway, he was this, he's undefeated. Undefeated, okay? No one's ever, ever, ever whipped him. He had one draw against the guy that he just beat this week, and they were both undefeated. They fought once before, and they had a draw. They fought again, and then, and then Tyson Fury won. And uh, what's interesting is, is his story of, of how things happened with him. He was this up-and-coming boxer, undefeated, doing very good. He defeated the previous champ, and, and then he just kind of, his life just spiraled out of control. He suffered from pretty extreme mental health problems, 
to the point to where he was very close to committing suicide. Um, I, I watched an interview with him, and he said he had a, he had a, a Ferrari, and he was driving his Ferrari, and I forget what he said, it was like 160 miles an hour, just something crazy, and was about to crash this, this Ferrari, and then he just said, right before he was doing this, he said he just, he just thought about his kids and his wife, and just said, you know, I, I, I can't do this, and he, and he stopped, and he says his hands were shaking, because he says he realized he was so close, he was so close to, to doing that. And so he made a commitment to himself that no matter how bad it got with his depression and his mental health problems, he, he didn't want to kill himself, but he went to a psych, a, a, either a psychiatrist, psychologist, I can't remember which one, I get confused on what, which is which, right? One prescribes and one, I don't know, I don't know. There's, some, there's a difference. Other, other people can tell you more. He went to, can I say it? He went to a shrink, right? He went to somebody that, that I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory sense. He, he went to somebody that, that, you know, could help with mental health problems, and it was this really famous person in uh, our well-known, you know, expensive, kind of like uh, the best of the best kind of person in Britain, and that person said, his dad went with him, and, and, the, and the, the, the person said, can I talk with, uh, with, with your dad privately? He said, yeah, go ahead. She told his dad, in all my years of doing this, I have never seen someone in as much danger as he is. He is in real danger of committing suicide. Don't let him by himself at all. So his dad stayed with him 24-7, all the time with him. He had a serious drug problem, alcoholism. He was a total mess, okay? He gained a bunch of weight. He got up to 400 pounds. That's how big he was. And, and, he, and he failed drug tests because, they, you know, they test you for, for drugs and steroids and all that kind of stuff. Well, he didn't have the steroids, but he had drugs in his system. So they stripped him of his title. They stripped him of, uh, of his license to fight. I mean, his career was over. It was over. He got suspended for all these years and all this. It was, just, it was done, okay? And so he just started drinking and using drugs and just, just really spiraling out of control. And I, and I wish you could hear the interview, how he described it. He was in such a dark place just mentally. And he said, I'd always struggled with mental health problems. I just never knew what it was, you know? But he had these real struggles. And then he says this was in... Uh, 2017, something happened. So he went to a, a, uh, a Halloween party there in, in, in England, and he says, I was wearing this, this, this skeleton suit. So he's this huge guy. He's six foot nine, 400 pounds, and he's wearing this ridiculous skeleton suit to this Halloween bash, and he just realizes, what am I doing here? You know, I was the heavyweight champion, and here I am, 400 pounds, of standing... And he says, I'm almost 30. These people are like young, like 20, 21. And what, what is going on with my life? Wearing this stupid costume, you know? So he says, I, I just left. He'll say, hey, where are you going? He says, I'm going home. He left, went home early. And he said that he, he went into his house and he went into his room and the lights were out. And I want to read to you, because I, 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 this is a quote. I wrote it down for what he was saying in this interview. I want to read to you what he, what he said. He said, I got on my knees and was praying and begging God to help me. I could feel tears running down my face. My chest was wet with tears. I knew I couldn't do it on my own. It was impossible for me. I had tried and tried and tried, but ended up back in the pub drinking. I had almost accepted that being an alcoholic was going to be my fate. So there I was on my knees, praying and crying out to God in this dark bedroom. And after about 10 minutes, I got up and I felt that the weight of the world had been lifted off my shoulders. And for the first time in years, I knew I was going to make a comeback. Isn't that an amazing experience, you know, thing? And as he shared that, and as I listened to this, you know, I thought to myself, you know, here's this, this guy, <laughs> all this going on in his life, and he just gets to this point where he is just, he just, he knows he, he can't fix this problem, and he cries out to God, and look what God has, has done for him, you know, to help him, and, 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 he, and he's, he's had this, this incredible comeback. Now, I'm not endorsing this kind of stuff, sports and boxing, and even where, where he's at with some things, you know, he's, he's kind of a colorful guy, and, but I think he's a sincere man. He, he claims to be a Christian, we should do a little study on some things because he's, he's a little out there. He's an interesting guy. He's got to meet, you don't have to meet him. I, don't, I can't meet him, but he's, you listen to this guy, and he's just interesting, you know? He's, he's authentic. 
he's very authentic. He gave his whole purse, like $9 million to charity, you know? Just said, hey, you know, psh, I don't need this stuff. I'm already a millionaire. Here, just give it all to charity, you know? Just interesting kind of kind of dude. And he, and he won this fight, and it's amazing. It's amazing what, what God can do for us when we come to him in our need. The problem is we often don't feel our need. And that in itself is a need. To come to God and say, you know what, I really don't even feel like, I'm not at that desperate point. Because what often happens with, with people, and listening to him, what has even probably happened to him on some level? We can come to God when we're absolutely desperate and cry out to God, and God shows up in a powerful way in our lives. And then we get better. And then, and then conti- instead of continuing to seek God, we're like, oh, okay, I'm better now. Good. Whew, that was good. I think I'll go be the heavyweight champ or whatever. You know what I mean? It's as opposed to really going deeper with this walk that God wants us to take. And this message today is really about how God wants to connect with us and us to him. And he will take us all the way if we just keep seeking him. Amen? Sound good? All right, here's the bottom line. You and I, humans, we were designed for a close, loving relationship with our creator. That was in the original design blueprint of humanity. But there's a problem. Who knows what that problem is? Yeah, it's sin. There you go. This is where your study guide comes in, okay? Isaiah 59, verse 2. It says, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. So because of the fall, humans are living in a state of malfunction. And the results of this are loneliness, addiction, broken relationships. Or we try to fill it with other things, maybe even good things, hard work, success, My wife and I were discussing this this week. We can even fill that emptiness with church activities. You really can. You know, if if there's tension uh, in families because there's not uh, there's not the surrender to Christ happening in the heart, therefore there's not the real discipleship happening, and there's a lot of tension and between husband and wife and kids and all this. You just get so busy doing stuff, even good stuff, that it kind of masks all that. Right? So even religion can be a way to mask it at times. But ultimately what God wants for us is that connection with him that is truly transformative and that transforms our relationships with others as well. But because of this sin problem that is, it's infected all of us, we're just functioning in this state of malfunction. And to heal this malfunction... And restore people to God. Well, that's why Jesus came here to this earth. Amen? That's the essence of the gospel. That's the bottom line. Now, 1,500 years before Jesus came, this people think it's kind of started with Jesus. The gospel came when Jesus came. No, the gospel's always been there, okay? It's just God has progressively revealed the gospel. 1,500 years before Jesus came, God set up a gospel-centered religious system. This system was designed to teach people his plan of salvation for mankind. At the heart of this system was the sanctuary. All right, this is also in your study guide. Psalm 77, verse 13, it says, Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. So we can look at this sanctuary that God established and we take this journey to the heart of God, to seeing what he's like and how how he is healing us and will his ultimate plan to heal us from this malfunction that, that sin has brought and restore in us this wholeness, okay? Like Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it what? Abundantly good, you know that one. I have come that, come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Not like I've come they may have life, and eh, that's pretty okay, right? He wants us to have life and have it abundantly. And this can only really be achieved by the transformative impact of Christ and the Spirit. It is not the abundant life doesn't mean, yeah, I'm just sitting back in a hammock all day and life is good and my servant brings me a, you know, a sugar-free, nice, uh, uh, sweet drink and life is great, right? It's It's not an easy, cushy life. 
that, that he's coming to bring us. But it is a very abundant life. Okay? It's there for us. We just have to be willing to take that journey. And the sanctuary, you'll see, shows us the steps in that journey. So let's break it down. You ready? This is a picture somebody took. Like, no, I'm kidding. There was no pictures back then. It was a, uh, you know, it's an artist put it together, and because it's very detailed in the book of Leviticus, right? A lot of detail. It needs to be this link, this, the, 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 the. I mean, just like it's like a, it's like a blueprint. It really is. And so artists can take this and they can really, you know, create it. Pretty remarkable. So obviously, it, it had a wall here. We kind of they've removed the wall so we can see what's going on here. But you had three main parts to the sanctuary. Who knows what this part out here was called? Yes, good job, the courtyard. And what about this part in here? Good job. Oh, I had my little line dividing it. Yes, and the holy place. And then what about this part? The most holy place, sometimes called the holiest of holies as well, okay? Now, who could come in here? Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, the high priest could, but others could come as well. This was for the people, right? If you were, if you were a part of the, of the covenant community or a part of Israel, either as you were born into it, you were circumcised, born into it, or you came into it as a convert, um, you could come into the, to the courtyard area, all right? Now, who could come in here? Could the people just roll up in here? No, they couldn't, but the priests could come in, okay? Now, what about in here? Could anybody roll up in here in the most holy place? All right, question. It's a little bit of a trick question, so think, okay? Could, could your everyday average priest go in there? No, that's right. Who, who, who's the only person that could go in there? The high priest, that's right. And could he just decide to go in there anytime he wanted? No. One day a year he could go in. What, what, when was it? Day of Atonement. Why am I preaching this sermon? You guys know this, man. I'm telling you. I'm impressed. Good job. Good job. Yeah, this is it. Courtyard, holy place, most holy place, these three sections. Now, all of this pointed to the life and ministry of Jesus, okay? The study guy does a really good job of breaking this down. I'm going to run through it kind of real quick and just show you how these different dimensions point to Jesus, and then we're going to put it all together, all right? This is like pulling out the different ingredients, right? When you're going to, when you're going to cook something, you say, oh, I need to make sure I got my, my, uh, my half a cup of chopped onions, and I got to make sure, you know, that I have my tablespoon of chili powder, and you have all that ready. I've learned that it's good to get all that ready before you start cooking, right? Because I've gotten halfway through things and realized, where's that at? Uh-oh, that's burning while I'm looking for it. You know what? Just prepare and get it all there before you start, right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go through and just kind of look at this kind of a little bit piece by piece, put it together, and then we're going to bake the cake, okay? Sound good? All right. John 10, verse 9. I'm going to keep quizzing you because you're doing so good today, all right? Jesus said, I, well, you won't know this one because he actually said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that's a little more famous of a statement, and you'll probably say that instead. But he actually said, I am the, anybody know? Close. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Now, that's interesting. Have anyone ever told you, you know what, I'm a door? That's just kind of a strange statement for a human being to make, right? I am a door. There's obviously a deeper meaning to this, Right? He is the gateway into something, right? So we have the same thing in the sanctuary. You have a way where you entered in. If you were out here, you were outside. But if you were, if you were connecting with God through His way of, of setting it up, right, the sanctuary system, then you've walked in through the door. Hebrews 10, verse 20, it says that Jesus has set up for us a new and living, do you know this one? Way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Now think about this for a minute. Remember there was this veil that's separating the, holy, the most holy place where it was like the presence of God, like the Shekinah glory was there. His, it's a symbolic representation of, of his presence and his throne room. So we can't just go rolling up in there because remember after their sin and the humanity, Adam and Eve, have to leave the garden because they can't be in the presence of God anymore. We can't just go rolling up in the most holy place now, okay? But it says Jesus, the veil is his flesh, right? And so he, he just opened the door for us to go right in there. John 1, verse 29, this is John the Baptist, all right? Now, maybe you know this one. This one's a pretty common one. He said, hey, behold the lamb. Good job. 
Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now that's interesting. You see all this imagery in here? I bet you've never met anyone that tells you I'm a lamb. It's just kind of strange, right? Or I'm a veil, or I'm a door. All of this is pointing us to something to show us what Jesus is here to do, who he really is. So this is a reference to the altar of sacrifice, right? When people would come in, they would bring an animal for sacrifice, such as a lamb, sacrifice that animal right there, and then then they go next to the laver and they, they wash off, okay? So Titus 3 and verse 5, it talks about the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. That brings us here to the laver, okay? Let's just keep rolling through this. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. So then we enter into the, into the holy place here and you have the, what's called the table of the shoe bread. And that's where they put this bread and they would change it out every week, you know, this this, this symbolism of Jesus, of He's the bread of life, feeding on His Word, and so on. Then you get here to John chapter 8 and verse 12. He says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So you have this menorah or the seven-branched candlestick that was always kept, kept going. And this is the light in there. And so there's Symbolic meaning to this, we get to Revelation 8 and verse 3, it says he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints. So the altar of incense here being a symbol of, of prayer, and we're going to tie all this together. Remember, we're just kind of putting the ingredients together right now. So hang in there, we're going we're gonna to bake the cake in a second. Okay. And then Hebrews 10, 16, I love this verse, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds. Isn't that good? I will write them. Where was God's law kept? Right there, right? On tables of stone, right below the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant, as God's morality being the foundation of His government. You know, we can trust God because God is trustworthy. And the reason He is trustworthy is because He is absolutely moral. He does not do anything that's wrong, okay? That's a huge element to trust, right? Can you trust someone that is not really moral? No, you can't trust somebody that lies or steals. Or you just can't trust people. So God has his law as the foundation of his government. That makes him absolutely and fully trustworthy, okay? But the mercy seat is also on top of that. So not only he's completely moral himself and calls us, to that standard of morality as well, but he also is full of mercy and grace. And mercy, it says, triumphs over judgment. That's good news, right? Especially for us being in this malfunction state where our morality is not flawless, but God's is flawless, but he also has mercy for people like us. Now, this whole thing that we just saw here from beginning to end, this whole system pointed to Jesus, all right? This is why when Jesus died, notice what happened. This whole thing was just all centered on Christ. So when Jesus is hanging on the cross, it says this. This is the moment Jesus dies. It's recorded in Matthew 27 and verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. <sighs> That's what it means. Not he gave up his spirit like, -doo 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 -doo, like, like drifting off into nowhere land. No, no, no. It means like he, he breathed his last breath. The, the, word, the word spirit means breath in the Greek. He gave up his breath. He just <sighs> took his last breath. He cried out, it is finished, and, and died. And then it says the next verse, at that moment that he died, the very moment that happened, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. This is important. From what? Top to bottom, not bottom to top. So this now, now, now by the time you get to Jesus' day, they had a much fancier one. Okay, it was kind of a, it was a, it was a kind of a rudimentary. In, in Moses' day, you get to Jesus' time, it's this magnificent temple like this, and this thing was torn, so a huge veil, and this was torn in two from top to bottom. So this separation between God and man, where you had to go through a priesthood, you couldn't just go walking up to God like in the Garden of Eden. Hey, how's it going, Father? Right? There's now a separation because our iniquities have separated us. And so if we're going to approach God, we have to come with a sacrifice and we have to go through a priesthood 
all of this is done away with. This is why, frankly, there is no need today for an earthly priesthood. There is only one priest. He's the high priest. He's Jesus. There is no earthly priesthood. There is no mediator between God and man except Jesus. So there is no need to go through anyone else. Tyson Fury didn't have to go see somebody to talk to God for him, right? He got on his knees, cried out to God, and God showed up because of this, because of what Jesus did on the cross, and it just tore that veil right in two from top to bottom, not man reaching up to God, bottom to top, but top to bottom, God reaching down to man, Jesus dying on the cross, and then removing that separation, that spiritual separation between God and man. And now spiritually, man can connect directly with God through Christ. There's the spiritual separation that is now removed. When Jesus comes again the second time, there is the physical separation that is removed, right? Because there's not a, we're physically still separated. We're not, we're not able to, you know, we're not, we're not looking at God right now. But he says that, one day that those who follow him will see his face. There will be a, a change. Okay, Now, this was huge. Like we said, the only person who ever entered here was, was the high priest. This was big, and now the thing's just torn wide open. So let's just walk through this and see how all of this pointed. Let's now bake the cake. Okay, All of this pointed us to Christ. So if we're a sinner, we walk in, sacrifice the lamb, when we come to Jesus, what do we do? We first come to him just as we are. Question. This is important. So important. Do we need to clean ourselves up before we come to Jesus? Yes or no? No. Big lie of the devil that you need to get yourself kind of cleaned up and straightened up before you come to Christ. The church can sometimes, I don't mean us, I just mean in general the Christian church or Christians, can sometimes get this a little backward and think that people need to be a certain way before they're able to be at church and be involved and so on. Now, there are standards of discipleship, of course. If, if I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus, he's going to call me to follow him. Yeah, absolutely. But he doesn't put anything in front of us and him, anything in front of us on the cross. We come directly just as we are. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast away. He doesn't cast people away. You come as a total mess. Like That's why I put... The, the boxer in there to begin with. You just come just as you are, from the club, messed up. Not good to go there in the first place. A lot of bad things can happen. He could have died in that Ferrari, and then we wouldn't be telling this great story. It would be a tragic story. It's dangerous to play with sin, so it's not cool to do this. But even when we find ourselves paying the consequences of this, of this malfunction that sin has caused in our lives, we come to Jesus just as we are. And he, and he accepts us as we are. It is absurd to think we have to somehow clean ourselves up to come to God. That's like saying, i got to get healthy before I go to the doctor. Well, if I'm healthy, I don't need the doctor, right? In fact, that's what they were saying to Jesus. They said, look, you're hanging out with sinners. He says, it's the sick that need a doctor. Okay, not, not, not the well. So we come to him just as we are. And what is the first step? We accept his death on the cross for us. Where he's not just a religious teacher who may can teach us some good things, but he is a savior who died for me. And I must accept this reality. Believe and accept this. And what happens when we accept Christ? He washes us of our sins, like the laver right here. He cleans us and makes us whole. Now, a lot of times we want to stop there. But is that really where it stops? Or does, it, or does the journey with Jesus continue all the way in here? Yeah, praise God for the cross. Praise God for forgiveness of sin and cleansing and giving us of His Holy Spirit. But then we have to continue moving forward. And we come here to the, to the showbread, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. How often do you eat? Every day, right? It's not something you do once a week. Now, let me ask you, how often do you feed on God's Word? Every day? Let it be every day, brothers and sisters, taking time every day to spend some time reading and studying God's Word. That's how we're feeding on Christ. That's how we're growing. And what happens when we're doing that? When we're 
when we're feeding on Christ, when we've come to Him, we've accepted Christ as our Savior, we're, we're washed and made new and we're reading His Word, do you think we have something to tell? Absolutely. We're the light of the world, the Scripture says, okay? We're this, this light, this lampstand that, that produced this light and it had oil in it. Now, what does oil symbolize in Scripture? Holy Spirit, right? So as we do this, we accept Christ, accept the cross, believing being cleansed of our sins, reading the Word. He's filling us with His Spirit. And we're light. We're, we're, we're involved in mission. It's not about us then. It's about ministry. It's about being light in the world. And then we get here to this altar of incense, which is prayer. That's the way we get and stay connected with God. And as we go through this whole journey of coming to the cross, being washed and cleansed of our sins, reading of the Word, sharing, witnessing with others, prayer and connection with God, he is then transforming us and writing His law on our hearts and in our minds. Amen? Now, do you see why it says in the Bible, your way, O God, is in the sanctuary? This is the heart of the sanctuary message, brothers and sisters. It is about Jesus and that everything that we find in the Old Testament, all of this symbolism, all of this imagery leads us to Jesus and just takes us on a journey to the very heart of God. And then in looking at Christ, as Paul says, with unveiled face, we are transformed into his image. Jesus. Jesus invites us to follow him. This is from your study guide. This is good stuff in your study guide, okay? Direct quotation. Jesus invites us to follow him on the path he has marked out for us through the veil into the courtyard. That's where we get started to encounter his selfless death for us at the altar of sacrifice onward to the laver for moral cleansing into the holy place to partake of the bread of life to study to read his word to the seven branch lampstand to experience the illuminating ministry of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives to approach God through Him in prayer at the altar of incense and ultimately to enter the most holy place to have His law of love written on our hearts. Amen. Isn't this cool? I mean, I just love this sanctuary message. It just points us all to Jesus beginning to end. So question, where are you in the journey? Just do a self-evaluation. We're not going to pass mics around, okay? And you, you have to spill to everybody in the... I had a class once. I know this is an offshoot. No, I'll do it anyway. I had a class once. It was pastoral counseling, and we had a, 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 a psychologist. I remember he was a psychologist teaching it, Christian psychologist. And he would have everyone get up every, uh, every morning before class. A different person had to get up and, and, and talk and share something, you know, about yourself. Everybody had to do it before the semester was over. So he'd say, okay, who's going to do it today? And, and, and it got to where people didn't want to do it, you know, but you have to do it. And so the class would start chanting when people would get up, spill, 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 and people would get up. So we're not going to do the spill thing. You don't have to get up and just share everything. And, but I want to ask you honestly, where are you at in this journey? Do a self-evaluation. So um, if you're at church today, you're, you're kind of in the courtyard, right? I mean, you're being exposed to, to the gospel. That's step one. Hey, praise God, you're in the courtyard. That's a good place to be. Now, when you encounter Jesus on the cross, what are you doing with this? Are you just kind of checking Jesus out? Just kind of, you know, a lot of people, they have an interest in Jesus because he is interesting. The truth is interesting. The gospel is very interesting. But it's got to go beyond just simply being interested. We have to actually accept him as our Lord, as our Savior, right? So have you, have you done that yet? Have you accepted him? Well, that's, that's really the step to do. Have you been cleansed? You've been washed, or are you still holding on to sin? Are you saying, no, oh, you know, I'm interested in Jesus, but I like this other stuff too? That's when things really changed for me. I had this epiphany one day because I got drugged to church by somebody, and the pastor there preached a sermon on heaven, and I realized, wow, that sounds like a nice place to be, and I'm not going. And then I really started thinking about this. This is crazy. What am I holding on to that's, that's worth trading heaven for? I really processed this. I thought about the, the few things that I knew I'd have to give up if I was going to follow Jesus. And I thought, well, I like doing this, that, and the other. 
And then I thought, okay, I can have this, that, and the other on table A, or I can have eternal life on table B. I am an idiot to choose table A over table B. So I need to follow Christ because it just makes sense. It was that simple in my head, and that and just that right there. And I made the decision that day, driving home from church by myself, pulled off on the side of the road, prayed, made a decision, and that was October 1st of the year 2000. I still remember it, and that was the turning point in my life. I had been interested in Jesus. I'd had some encounters with him. I, probably, I would have said I was a believer. I'm a Christian, but I was not a disciple. There's a big difference between being a Christian. I mean, like, what is it? Like half the world says they're Christians, right? There's a difference between, between considering yourself a Christian. There is a difference even between being a church member than being a disciple. Jesus said, go and make disciples. What is a disciple? It is someone that follows Jesus, okay? Revelation 14, verse 4, it says those in the last days that are following him, it says they follow the lamb wherever he goes. They don't follow him for a little while and say, eh, I don't feel like going there. No, they follow the lamb wherever he goes. That's being a disciple of Jesus, so where are you at in the journey? Have you, have you accepted Jesus? Have you, have, you, have you been cleansed of your sins? Why wait? What are you waiting on? There's only a few things that can keep you from doing it. One is unbelief. You may just say, I mean, if that was true, I guess that'd be okay. But come on, man. I don't believe this stuff. No problem. I'll tell you what Jesus will do for you. He says in John 14, verse 21, he says, if you have his commandments and keep them, he will manifest himself to you. So why don't you test him out and see if it's real or not? Just, just try it out. I've given you this analogy before. It's like if I go somewhere where they've never seen a television, and I tell them, you know, you can go push that button, and you can see an image of things happening on the other side of the world. And they say, that's ridiculous. Because they, they, they can't imagine it. They have no concept of it, right? We can't imagine things we have no concept of, that we haven't experienced. It's like trying to tell a blind person what the color blue is like. How, how do you describe blue to someone that can't see anything? You just, well, it's, just, it's blue, man. I mean, blue, what you, right? It's something you just have to experience by seeing. So with Jesus, if we just haven't had that experience with him, it is logical to question the reality of it. Jesus has an answer for us on this. He says... Keep my commandments, and I will manifest myself to you. So there is a condition there, and then there is a promise. You can empirically test that. Just like if I were to say, we were arguing back and forth, me and the guy about the TV. Oh, man, that's ridiculous. I don't know what that stupid box is, but what you're saying isn't true. There's no way you can push a button and see something on the other side of the world. How could this guy settle it in his mind that what I'm saying is true? There's really only one way. What is it? Go push the button then. <laughs> We're arguing about something that you can actually test and see if it's true, so quit arguing and go push that button. With Christ, you can test and see that what he's saying is true. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You have this kind of language all throughout Scripture. He even mentions it about in Malachi about financial giving. He says, Test me in this, says the Lord. He calls us to test him. He says, return tithes, give offerings, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing on you, there won't be room enough for it. So why don't you test and try, right? Give it a try. So that's one reason people may have. They say, look, you know, I don't know if I believe this stuff. Fine, fair enough. I, I had some real shaky things with it as well, to be honest with you. I realize I have, and we all have been, and I've always been sort of philosophically minded and read a lot before, before I was a Christian and whatnot, so I have been influenced a lot by very worldly systems of thinking, and so this, you know, the simplicity of the gospel and all that I just kind of thought was a little ridiculous on some level, you know, like, come on, like, this is like stuff from a long time ago, I mean, that worked for people 2,000 years ago, we have a lot more information now, you know, that's how I thought about it, but... I was willing to give it a try, and I'm telling you, God manifested himself in my life. And even people around me that were unbelievers saw it. 
they even said, man, I don't know what happened to you, but you are different. I just, <laughs> you're just different. I was different. It was a pretty remarkable change. So are you hanging out here in the courtyard? All right, cool. Um, accept him. Move forward. There could be another issue, and that is, honestly, love of sin. You know, it says in, in the book of John, it says that people didn't receive him because men love darkness more than light. Okay? There just is that element there. The Bible says there is pleasure in sin for a season. It is pleasurable. There, there is a certain fleshy pleasure in being your own God, in being in rebellion, and doing what you want to do. It may seem right, but the Scriptures say there is a way that seems right to man, but the end is what? death. God will one day abolish rebellion. He has to because he's a God of love and this rebellion has ruined the world. It can't go on like this forever. He's got to put a stop to this. And so why w it's like where I was at in that place years ago when I said I've got table A with my sins, my cherished little sins, my little idols I don't want to give up. Or I've got table B, eternal life with God. What is more valuable? If I, if I had to put a price tag on it, think about it. Th think of whatever little cherished sins you may have. How much would it take for you to give them up? What if somebody were to say, I'll give you $10 million if you give that up? Would you say, well, you know what? That, yeah, I love you. now we're talking. I hear people say this kind of stuff, you know, like, oh, well, you know, if I'm a Christian, can I do this? Can I do that? It's almost like they're, like, counting the cost. I'm like, do you, do you realize how valuable what you're gaining with God is, right? But if I were to say, I'll give you $10 million to, 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 to stop X, hey, dude, X is gone. Where's the check, right? Jesus gives us so much more than that, right? And so if our issue is unbelief, Jesus will solve that for us. Keep his commandments. He'll manifest himself to you. Okay? If your issue is this like a love of sin, then really do an honest evaluation and say, is this really a smart life choice to be in rebellion against my creator and join his enemy to live as I please and do as I please? Is that the smart thing to do, right? Just evaluate. Just evaluate. All right. So we come to Jesus, accept his death on the cross, cleansed of our sins, feeding on his word. Maybe you're here. So how's your devotional life going, right? Are you reading the word each day? Are you feeding on his word? If you're not doing that, then take that next step in the journey. Okay. What happens if I were to eat just maybe two or three times a week? How would my health be? Probably a bit uh, malnourished, right? Oh, God, God designed me to eat every single day, unless I'm fasting for some reason, which I don't do much because I like to eat. But um, Yeah, but you get what I'm saying. The normal protocol is eating daily, okay? Feeding on his word daily. How about this? Are we, is our life centered on serving others and being a, a light in this world and, and, and showing the love of Jesus to people? Or is it more of, I'm just being honest here, is it more of kind of a, I go to church, it's cool, but, you know, I'm making some pretty good dough right now. We're having a lot of fun, and my life's kind of more centered on me. You know, are we really kind of living a life that is focused on other people and how we can bless and help other people, right? How about our prayer lives? That's important. And then at the end of the day, guys, let's just be honest with ourselves. How, how's your character? How's mine? When I do an honest evaluation of that, I, I see things that need to change. Maybe you're all perfect. I don't know. You're pretty nice, but I don't think perfect, right? I don't think perfect. You know, Jesus had such a, a, a moral character about him that even when they were nailing him to a cross, he said, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. I don't think that would be my reaction. I don't have that positive of a reaction often when someone is just annoying me much less killing me, 
You know what I mean? If I'm dealing with an incompetent person on the phone trying to solve some tech issue and I'm just going, what is wrong with this person, man? You have a very loving attitude, you know what I mean? Jesus had this loving attitude for people that were just downright hateful to him. Man, how can, how can I get there? Mercy, how can you get there? Remember, I think it was last week we hit this verse. 1 John 2, is either 2 verse 5 or 2 verse 15, right? But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. Okay? So that's the journey, guys. Keeping his word, make it real complicated. We just come to Jesus as we are, broken and messed up, accepting his death on the cross, being washed of our sins. We say, now I've got to learn what it means to follow this, this, this Savior. I'm reading his word. He's filling me with his spirit. My life is then, is then, is then shifting from being self-focused and self-centered to being others-focused and ministry-centered. That's letting my light shine and praying and connecting with Jesus and his laws written on our hearts and minds. Done. That's the gospel. And this is from your study guide. Read it. Whew. Go home today and read it. It's good. In one epic burst of luminous glory, all the symbols of the sanctuary converge in Christ with perfect fulfillment. What I find so amazing about this as well, we've, we've been talking about how we can know these things are real and so on. When you get into the Bible, seeing the intricacy and depth of this theology is remarkable. When you consider this is written by about 45 different people over a span of about 1,500 years, and you see this, when you start piecing all this together, how it fits together, isn't this amazing? It's absolutely amazing. How can we say anything to God but I'm in? Yes. I want to take this journey to the heart of God symbolized by the various steps depicted in the sanctuary. Amen? Wherever you're at in the journey, head in the courtyard, accepting Jesus on the cross, being cleansed of our sins, reading the Word, ministering to others in the power of the Spirit, prayer and connection with God and His law being written on our hearts and minds. Amen. Our closing song is song number 185. Okay, this is a beautiful hymn. It's entitled, Jesus is All the World to Me. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing.
brothers and sisters, please don't leave today without taking the next step in the journey. Decide what it is and take that next step with Jesus. Father, thank you so much for making the the path to heaven very plain for us. Oh, Father, help us to really value this wonderful treasure for what it is, Father. Something more valuable than all the money in the world, a knowledge of you and life forever with you in the earth made new. May all of us be there, Father, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.